You're listening to Errol Parker and Clancy Overall, editors of the Batuta Advocate on Desert Rock FM. Welcome back to the Batuta Advocate radio show recording down here in Budgie Smuggler Studios, downtown Batuta in the old city district. And today we're joined by a friend of the show, I guess you'd call him, uh, a, you know, a bloke that we, uh, we keep in touch with over the years and have done since we were all part of the Brisbane push down there on uh, on Vulture Street. We were all young, aspiring journos, and he was a young, aspiring muso. Bernard Fanning, thank you for joining us today. G'day, fellas. How are you? Very good. I was, a, I was a young, aspiring journo once as well. Really? Yeah, I I'd, I'd yeah. went to university and did journalism. Okay. What, 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 well, was, what was I was enrolled. Yeah. I was enrolled. He, I he, he, he was a couple of years under me. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> What, what were your dreams there? What were you thinking? Were you thinking uh, I'm going to be part of Four Triple Z's uh, street team, or <laughs> were you more? No, I think I would. I wanted Crash Craddock's job at the Courier Mail, uh, right? Being the cricket writer. Yep, that was part of the idea. I mean, I think I also um, had ideas that journalism was something quite different to what it actually is. Mm. Yeah, that you that you just. To write really long stories that are really interesting all the time. <laughs> and get paid a lot. <laughs> <laughs> get paid heaps. Yeah. yeah, it's just, we, you know, you, you end up making a career out of it like we have and you come to learn it's just alcoholism and eavesdropping, mate. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, I, I had the booze part covered, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, the rest of it, not so much. We've started, obviously, at the, the very start of your career there. What was the, people don't know what the, Brisbane music scene looked like? You know, everyone has a good idea of what they reckon the Whitlams were doing down there in Newtown or what was happening down in, in, in Melbourne. But, you know, what was happening? Were you guys sitting on the veranda at the Regatta Hotel just strumming guitars? How did it how, how did it all take place in Brisbane? Well, I joined Powderfinger after it was already up and running. So JC and Bish and Hoggy were the original three guys that went to school together. And then I went to – when I was studying at UQ, I met Hoggy and um, he asked me to come and have a jam. So they were already – I mean, they were playing at parties and that kind of stuff. So there was there was nothing going on in terms of the scene at that point, I don't think. But I think the, the main thing about the Brisbane scene was that there were – because it, it was pretty separate to what was going on in Sydney and Melbourne mm-hmm. – and because it was a lot smaller, there was the opportunity for lots of different types of bands to play together. There was a place called Metropolis, which was under the Maya Centre, uh, that had a thing on Friday afternoons called Rock Against Work, um, <laughs> which was uh, <laughs> which was because you know this is the early nineties, so yeah. there, were, there were a lot of people on the dole yeah. at that point as well because unemployment was very high. Paul Keating surf team. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. You bet. Um, that kind of became a bit of a centre for the scene. There was also a, a building in the valley, which was the old Target building in yeah. in Fortitude Valley, where a lot of the bands had rehearsal rooms. So us and Brasilia and Scream Feeder and Pangaea and Brasilia and Pangaea kind of became Regurgitator eventually, members of each of those bands. So custard all sorts of bands you know yeah. that were that were in there all in one place because it was the cheapest place to rent and it was full full on dive it was you know there were plenty of junkies around and stuff yeah, as well a bit of a squat yeah i guess mm. but this i think it was that idea that you know it wasn't long after the joe era was over as yeah. well and prior to that all the bands most of the bands had left yeah gone to sydney or gone to london gone wherever and i guess our generation of bands were the first ones to say, fuck it, let's mm-hmm. stay here. And yeah. why would we go and live in some rising damp disaster area in Newtown <laughs> uh, <laughs> when we can live in, you know, glory in a Queensland yeah. or in, in Indrapilly? Yeah. Yeah. So was there like a, uh, a tipping point where you decided that, you know, perhaps you'd made the right decision in staying in Brisbane and making music as opposed to, you know, to taking a job at the Courier Mail and having to write about grey 
cricket, you know, from <laughs> from everywhere, from down to Logan, up to Redcliffe, you know. Would, Wynnum. Yeah. yeah. Um, Wynnum, one of the great clubs. <laughs> it is. It took a while for that realisation to come to pass because – I joined the band in 1989 and we started getting paid in 1996. So, um, you know, we were working other jobs and, yeah. and I mean, all the other bands around were the same yep. as us. But we also, I think us and Custard and Screen Feeder in particular and Pangaea really committed to touring. So we just, we just worked our asses off doing whatever we could to make money to buy an Econa van and then be able to drive to Sydney and Melbourne and then eventually to Adelaide as well. And we did that kind of every six weeks for yeah. a couple of weekends yeah, and then right. come back to Brisbane. And Sydney, it would be Newcastle Thursday, Sydney, yeah. you know, North Sydney Friday, South Sydney Saturday, Wollongong Sunday, yeah. that, that kind of weekend, and correspondingly in, in Victoria as well. And Brizzy, it was Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, and Brisbane, maybe Toowoomba. Yep. I think that com- we were really committed to it. We were, we were pretty young. We were only in our early 20s, so you're a lot more tolerant of being dirt poor, I think. <laughs> Poverty <laughs> stricken, age. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's hard to complain about being being in a band yeah. Yeah. and getting around with your mates and having some beers and talking to birds. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's kind well, of a lifestyle, really. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we made a lot of friends. That was a really big part of it too. We, we made friends with people and then they would come back and bring friends with them and that's, that's how a band grew in those days. This, this is prior to Triple J, obviously, being national. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that you, you know the band was driving around in an a Connor line, so it's a Connor van. van. Yeah, the, 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 that you said there. There was, um, I think, the same sort of van is mentioned in uh, a Neil Young song called "Tonight's the Night." Yeah, and there's not a lot of people, I don't think, that would know that the name Powderfinger comes from a Neil Young song. Can you tell us the story right. about why you decided to? You know, name yourselves after quite an obscure Neil Young song, or why they did before you joined. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah, mean, yeah. I I joined after it was already named. You know, I was familiar with the song because I was a Neil Young fan anyway. Yeah, um, and I think they honestly the way that they decided was they they were doing gigs at the Regatta. Yep, JC and Bish were doing gigs at the Regatta, and I think they graffitied it on the toilet stall. And said, "Yeah, that looks pretty fucking good." So yeah. that, was, that was it. it. wasn't It wasn't a big decision, you know. Yeah. Um, no one still really knows exactly what the kind of meaning of that song is. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think Neil Young's ever really explained it. No. You because know. I heard that he wrote the song uh, for Leonard Skinner, but you know, didn't really get it there in time. As in, for them to play. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, I mean, that would make sense because it's definitely got the very southern kind of yeah. sentiment to it, yeah. hasn't it? With he the- did go through that phase where he was, you know, really yeah. into the south. Uh, as they said, southern men don't need him around anyhow. So. Yeah, that's right. They did. They did. It was quite the riposte from Ronnie Van Zandt, wasn't it? <laughs> that was yeah. the first beef. That was the yeah. first. Before Tupac and Biggie, that was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah. It was yeah. from Canada to Alabama. <laughs> Now, how did it feel coming up? I mean, you, you guys have obviously had a lot of commentary, social commentary in your music. People don't like being called political bands, and, and sometimes that can hijack a whole entire kind mm-hmm. of uh, discography to say that. But, you know, you, you guys touched on things and you sang about things. But you, the wave of music that was coming out of Brisbane uh, with you guys, as you said, all those bands before, The Gurge and, and Powderfinger and, and, and Custard, weren't nearly as hardcore as the guys that came before you because that was the Sir Joe era where, yeah. you know, tropical goths, basically. Yeah. What, what was the it like to pine- come up? Pineapples at the dawn of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and what was the other one? I yeah. once killed a gopher with a stick, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I mean, those guys were actually, and the Saints, you know, yeah. and those, those kinds of bands, the ups and downs, they, they, were, they endured 
the special branch stuff that yeah. you know that Kev Carmody was talking to you guys about yeah. In, yeah. in in your pod that you had with him. I've I left school in '86, so my first year at university was '87, and that's when that's when Chris Masters blew open the whole yeah. the whole corruption story, which everyone knew. Yeah, yeah. it was just never. Never spoken about. Yeah, yeah. We we definitely had an easier time than than those guys did in terms of we did, we weren't having gigs shut down and people being bashed for being there. <laughs> you you weren't getting hit with phone books behind the yeah, car. Yeah, e- no. exactly. <laughs> so, and and that also explains why a lot of those bands left. Yeah, um, because I think the atmosphere in Brisbane at that time was ultra conservative. People were very reluctant to speak out about anything. So, yeah, like there was a Nationals member. In the heart of Brisbane, wasn't there back in the yeah, yeah. Oh, new, really? New farm Fair swung to the gnats. Like. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that kind of explains it, doesn't it? Yeah. Jerry, Jerry Mander with a capital Jerry. But um, yeah, look, I, I think from from the beginning when I was writing songs, I mean, I'd always loved Bob Dylan and yep. Neil Young and the Beatles, and they were all people that had you know strong political points of view. But I think also their measure for whether a song actually made it onto a record was whether it was a good song or not yeah. not just not just the political content and yeah. that was that was all, always kind of our measure as well yeah. i think that you if you got if you got something to say it's got to be well communicated but it also has to be you know presented yeah. Within a good a good tune, yeah. You want to hear you want to hear it at a party too, yeah. That's right, and I yeah. think one of the criticisms of Powderfinger, I think, was that sometimes it was too easy on the ear. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't there wasn't a radical enough agenda there or whatever, and um, it's probably fair criticism. But I wasn't oh, yeah. really I wasn't really interested in in that. I I, I hadn't grown up as a punk. No. And I wasn't going to pretend to kind of be one. You know, yeah. I, I, I really loved really melodic music. And if you can deliver a message that has some weight to it, but also that you can whistle, yeah, then all the better, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the music industry, I think, probably aside from Australian music scene, aside from maybe acting, probably has the most bitching going on in it, doesn't it, as well? <laughs> like... I mean, you just meet some of these heroes. You meet your heroes. You meet a musician who you've loved your whole, you know, your whole life, and then you ask them about another musician you've loved, and they say the most horrible things about them. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's it's, just a, it. it's a really big part of it, isn't it? It's and it's a really disappointing part of it. I guess it's the same in every industry, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things, good things about being from Brisbane, and one of the reasons that we kind of leaned further into being and staying in Brisbane was yeah. that we were removed from the bullshit yeah. that went yeah, on in right. Sydney and Melbourne and and we didn't like it. Yeah. And we didn't yeah. we didn't associate ourselves with it. You know, we knew the people in Brisbane. Hoggy was Ian Hogue was he worked at the zoo. Yeah. In in yeah, Brisbane right. and and so did Darren, I think. For the listeners, um, that's the that's a live music venue in the valley, the zoo. Yeah, not yeah. Not yeah. The, not I don't the think Brisbane, Brisbane has a I don't think Brisbane has a real zoo. It's no. a zoo. No. No, it doesn't. Well, Lone Pine, mate. Come on. <laughs> um <laughs> but yes. but you know, those guys were probably more heavily involved in the in the local scene than, yep. than I ever was. Yeah. I always enjoyed it. But I, I never really was a huge participator in that. I, you know, I like live music, but it's pretty it's pretty noisy, and there's a lot of people around. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot like work. <laughs> it can, it can be a bit of a pain in the ass. And I also moved, you know, out of Brisbane in about 2000 as well. I moved. Well, to, it was still Brisbane, but I, lo- I moved out west, out near Mogul, kind of thing. Right. So yeah. it was a mission in those right. days to to kind of get in there and be part of the scene but yeah you're right about the bitching thing that that (laughs) that is an integral part of it and there's there's another interesting phenomenon which i've talked to a lot of other musicians about where you may actually really despise somebody's music and (laughs) you meet them and they're they're just fucking great he's a fucking great guy and then and then their music gets better yeah yeah yeah. you know it's just how it is. It's just how it is. You're much more forgiving when you've got the kind of <laughs> the personal connection, I guess. 
tell us which tour it was. Do you think where you just because was it was it a stark difference? Was it a was it an overnight difference between the? Did you go from the tour to you know touring around in the van to Toowoomba and the like to? Two planes. I mean, you ended up getting your own plane. Yeah, but what, <laughs> they didn't. They, you didn't go from van to plane. What? When? When was it that you noticed how oh, things are different on the road as a member of Powderfinger? Okay, just let me clear something up about that plane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is probably very necessary. Uh, it wasn't our plane. It was a Jetstar plane, and Jetstar, might I add, on our biggest tour, we were flying on Jetstar. Yeah, uh, but they were. The reason that we were involved with those guys was that they were donating a ton of money to Yallery, which was yeah. uh, an organisation that sponsored um, Indigenous kids to come from far-flung places to get a private education in the city and board and all that sort of stuff. So that was part of the whole tour idea. Yeah, the plane, the plane idea wasn't it wasn't my idea. <laughs> well, it communicated very well through the photo of you all if, standing in front of me. Yeah. It wasn't, was it? It was horribly communicated. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway. like you'd have like you'd have a look at that image, and then you're like, "Well, this could be like Elton John's plane that's got a you know like a <laughs> piano up in business class, exactly. and like all these all these lounges in it." But yeah, but it was yeah, it was just your standard issue jet star with fucking. Yep. 700, 700 other punters that were on their connection to fucking Cooter. You know. <laughs> Back to the uh, question about touring. There was a song called Pick You Up, which was on Double Allergic, which is a record we put out in 1996 that kind of that went on to Triple J and that got you paid. Went. Yeah, then we started getting yeah. paid. Uh, well, we got off the Nice scheme because we were on the Nice scheme at that point, yeah. which was for the listeners, um, that was the new enterprise something scheme, industry scheme, um, where we were basically paid the dole, the equivalent of the dole, but we had to submit, you know, like Your our hours. business f- plans to yeah. <laughs> to the Department of Social Security and um, justify our existence of being paid by the government to do it. It was, it was actually a great idea and it's an initiative that should be, be yeah. oh for the arts i mean especially in the conditions that the arts industry is in now it's i mean it's mm. just fucking decimated so but yeah double allergic was when we went from probably we might have been when we first caught planes but the first plane yeah. I, ever, I ever caught was from adelaide to brisbane um we used to have a lottery because we couldn't afford for everyone to fly like we could afford <laughs> for two to fly and the other six including crew would drive and then the, so that just went around on a short straw basis and and the whoever, lonely drive the hay plane Adelaide to mate. brisbane the, the hay plane it's a good time out there isn't it jeez yeah. jeez yeah. we we knocked a few roos over on that trip those trips i'm gonna say um, and uh so yeah probably around 96 is when things started to kind of pick up and we we actually started to you know be able to pay rent from yeah yeah from our job and then, yeah, and then it just became, you know, hookers, cocaine, yep. Private, yep. private jets. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> you would have all been able to fly by the time Internationalist came out. Spent a week at number one. Yep. How much did your fortunes change after that? Because then it really seemed like things started to gas up for you. Yeah, they did. And, I mean, the, I guess the thing with any kind of success in any industry – you, you just get a lot busier yeah. because there's more, you're more in demand. So we then started touring internationally as well. So yeah. we would do probably two or three tours in Australia on a record and then we'd probably do a couple of tours to the States and to Europe as well or wherever we could. We just toured yeah. as much as we possibly could. So, yeah, I mean, we were definitely, you know, financially better off we, we always kind of were putting the spoils of anything that was happening in Australia into being able to go and travel and tour overseas and do all that sort of stuff as well. So we were very lucky. We had an incredible run, especially those years between kind of Double Allergic and, and Vulture yeah. Street. Yeah. All those records were really well received and, and we had a great time doing it as well. I mean, yeah. the, it wasn't all... A great time. That's we yeah. we generally had a great time, and it's much easier to look back on now as as a great yeah. time. But 
it was really hard work. And we, and we also, um, we were really determined to not be like the, those kind of eighties rock excess bands, yeah, you right. know, glamour, where glamour, yeah. that, that was totally not our thing, which is, sounds kind of boring now. Um, but that was, that was very much the, the kind of spirit of the times too, for most of the bands around, you know, the, the, our contemporaries were very much like that as well. You were living excess by Brisbane standards. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Getting a taxi instead of a bus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Heaps of pubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Getting a taxi home after Rick's closed instead of instead of getting the 85, the Kenmore 85. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we did have a really good run there, but we worked really hard and we were always determined to just keep looking forward. That was That was the thing we didn't. We, we didn't really know how to handle the sort of success, again, I guess yeah. you'd say, of things like ARIA awards and stuff like that. We, yeah. It just, it didn't, we didn't know really what it meant, I guess. Yeah. It actually meant a lot more to the people around us, like our families and the people that we worked with, like our management and record labels and those sorts of people. It wasn't that we didn't give a shit. We, we were appreciative of it, but... It didn't matter to us, yeah. you know. We we weren't really concerned with that sort of stuff. We just wanted to keep getting better. That was really what it was all about. It was a kind of tangible thing you could carry. It was something you, your dad could say to his mates when they're asking how you go, and you go, "Oh, they won an aria." So yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know that that stuff's great because you you can't underestimate the amount of support we got from our families as well, yeah. and and our partners as well. I mean, our long suffering girlfriends and and wives. That's yeah. that's a big part of it. That that you're away. A lot, yeah. you know. Touring, you said you, you know, you kind of, you know, there was a point where you all started going overseas, kind of reinvesting the money you were making into spreading the word. Where, where did you find uh, the surprise fan bases? We ask this to every guest. Where, yeah, where, right. Where did you find, um, you know, you know, sticky fingers is it's Chile. <laughs> That's really? where they're uh, yeah, yeah right. just come to Chile. Yeah, and okay. and then you know, I think. Uh, Silver Chair had a lot of love in South America too. Yeah, yeah, they did. That was one of our big regrets. Actually, we never got a release in South America, so we never right. went there, which right, is a real right. shame. We subsequently now have a have quite a few South American friends, fans from fans yeah. from all, from all over the place, Brazil and whatnot. Um, but we did. We actually did quite well in Holland and Germany and Canada, and I think that is probably largely due to the fact that a lot of Dutchies were out here backpacking and yeah. whatnot and lots of travelers that took the music back mm-hmm. to their own countries you know but we didn't we didn't actually end up in very obscure places by those yeah. standards it was mostly western europe the well, uk it was pre, pre-internet too so you can't just that's get right upon yeah that's that's right that yeah. i mean that's it's a whole different scenario now the way that mm. that music's disseminated so yeah yeah do you think it's gotten better or or it's gotten worse like in terms of you know, what young people experience now with the music industry? Like, was it a bit more innocent and innocuous kind of back then where it was more or less more insular where now you've got, you know, your music's got a global audience from day dot if you want it to? Yeah, that's right. You could kind of make that charge every 20 years. Yeah. yeah. It used to be more insul- innocent and insular and whatnot. There's, I think it's definitely got better for punters. No yeah. doubt about that. There's, I mean, music's essentially free, or it's mm. what is it, ten bucks a month for the yeah. Yeah. entire history of recorded music, mm. which yeah. is also we will probably look back on and just go how fucking absurd that is. Um, yeah. You know that that idea that it's virtually free. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, for punters, it's great. I think for bands, there's there is that thing where you can go direct to a global audience, which is is a great thing. But there's also the the thing that's missing is the kind of tribal atmosphere, yeah. That that still existed when we were when we were starting and and through to probably the even the early two thousands, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And then once playlisting and all the streaming stuff began, then the way that people bought and consumed music was is completely different now. And and yeah. you know, I grew, we grew up in the seventies and eighties, yeah. so albums were were king and that's what we were determined to make to make albums where you had a collection of songs that kind of all went together whereas you know these days you'd be you'd be listening to Cindy Lauper 
and Bon Jovi on yeah. the same playlist. Whereas yeah. in, in those days that would never have happened because, yeah. you know, you, you had your denim jacket, your denim vest with, with the patch on it. You, mm. if, that, if that was you, you weren't listening to Cindy Lauper. Yeah, and, yeah. And, you, and your second favourite band was the band that just opened for your favourite band. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally right. But, yeah, there's, there's a big change in identity, isn't there, yep. in, that, in that regard? I mean, that's a massive rabbit hole as well because identity is a, is a very loaded word these days. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But, but localism, you know, you guys probably did find a good balance between that hyper, hyper localised but also hyper isolated, you know, era of the Saints and yeah. now, and now it's kind of in, in, in between that and big sound, you've got powder figure. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, I guess. Yeah. And I mean, I think, I think you guys probably absolutely fucking nailed that with euphoric Queensland memes. The idea that you know, <laughs> that, we, we turned that, you uh, into a martyr. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it was genius. It was so funny that stuff, but. Just yeah. yeah, I mean the the kind of idea of Powderfinger has become quite outsized mm. by virtue of the fact that Brisbane is a one paper town, and mm. that contributes really heavily to that that sort of idea, doesn't it? Yeah, you know? you've got this uh, new release coming out. We'll get to that in a second, but it mm. is worth mentioning. You know the work you guys have done for Brisbane's music scene. There's there's a couple of venues that, that a couple of the boys have gotten behind over the years that have you know given mm-hmm. Brisbane capacities that they kind of didn't really have at hand. There's you yep. know of course the Trifford and now Festival Hall, Fortitude Hall, Fortitude Music Hall, yeah, Fortitude, Fortitude Music Hall. Um, was yep. that always something that you'd all talk about? Uh, I was. I think it was always something JC yeah. thought about. He always had this idea of having a having a. Uh, bar called Base Camp because, uh, you know, he's a bass player. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> That's about as witty as the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and I think partly because it gives him access to his own bar as yeah, well. Yeah, that would yeah, have been yeah. a big part of it. But, yeah, I mean, we were, we were very happy to kind of contribute to the idea of, of Brisbane being a place that you can be proud of, mm-hmm. you know, that that's yeah. where you're from. Yeah. Um, and a place that you don't leave. Really. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Because yeah. that really was the case from from the yeah. 60s on when yeah. once people had the opportunity to leave, they just yeah. bailed. Yeah. yeah. So unless they were settling into kind of Brisbane suburban life, which is also yeah. just as valid like most of our parents did. But, yeah, I mean, we, we always wanted to try and support local bands and all that sort of stuff, always trying to have people on the bills that we were playing that, that gave them a leg up as well. It was kind of a bit self-fulfilling, really, because, you know, when Nirvana came out and then Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and all these bands came out of, out of Seattle, that idea of a scene became a thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That it hadn't necessarily been. And yeah. so then Custard, Regurgitator, Powderfinger, Scream Feeder, whatever, Savage Garden to a lesser extent, yeah. all, <laughs> all got lumped in together as a scene, like we all hung out together and, yeah. you know, shared girlfriends, which yeah, yeah. which was not the case. Yeah. So that was also that spirit of the times thing as yeah. well, the zeitgeist thing as well, that, that the media helps to fan that stuff. Newcastle um, gets a bit of that too, don't they? You know, yeah. they're, they're, oh, good Newey boys. Oh, yeah, they're from Newey. Newey, you're screaming jets down to silver chair. It's yeah. the Brisbane of New South Wales. <laughs> uh, it is, it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just as punchy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, I, I just quickly on your um, on on this new release from Powderfinger. It's the first edition of the bootlegs, which I'm hoping there will be many more. Can you tell us how this came about? Because of course, this came about um, after your small reunion show. Yeah. So, where did this new material come from? Well, we had been, like, just to rewind a bit, we'd been getting together and we'd been meeting during the, the lockdown stuff on Zoom um, yeah. once a week, actually. We are the most overmet band in the history of music. Um, <laughs> it's incredibly anally managed by Paul and, and Rach um, in, in the nicest possible way. We'd been getting together because Odyssey Number no. 5 was having its 20th anniversary in September. And yep. we wanted to kind of 
do something for the release, make a good a good bonus disc or whatever. Mm-hmm. So we started about a year before that, we started going through all of our stuff. We got together and we hung out for a few days at my studio here in Byron. And we started to put stuff together and Nick Didier, who was our producer for most of our records, is my partner at the studio. And so he started mixing that stuff. And initially those songs were going to be bonus material for Odyssey number no. five. Yeah. Called Oddity Number no. Five. And then we found all this stuff that we'd not so much forgotten about, but it just it just hadn't really been considered. And it, and it was from right across our career. So it was yeah. from ninety eight till till right at the end, till the last song we recorded. So- it, as it came together and as Nick mixed it, and we'd also found all this other bonus material for Odyssey Number no. Five, we realized it was it was better than just a bonus just bonus tracks. We wanted to make it into a to an actual record. So, yeah, yeah we just uh, – n- a lot of credit has to go to Nick as well for the way that he put it together and the way that he produced it because I don't think if it was the five of us putting it together, we would have put it together in the same way and made it into that record. It was good to have someone outside yeah, but inside that, that was could kind of captain it a little bit because – we hadn't really worked together for 10 years either, you know, since 2010. We hadn't done done much together. But we ended up having a – it was a really incredibly productive and cooperative and fun time. We we all really surprised ourselves because – None of that was recorded at the time ready to go onto, onto a disc? You've, yeah, you've it was. So, so there's – the oldest song on that is called Rule of Thumb, which was recorded for the internationalist session. Yeah, uh, for that for that record, but it didn't fit on the record, and it didn't. Right. It wasn't the right the right tune to go on with the rest of the songs. Just didn't fit. So the case for most of them is that they were recorded for album sessions, mm-hmm. but they there was either another song that kind of pipped it to go on yep. the record that yep. might have been similar or something like yep. that, or we we never quite finished it. So day by day, for example, which was the first single off this that was recorded for Vulture Street. Right. But it was never mixed. Okay. I, while we were doing the session, we probably said, we're not getting close enough with this. We, mm-hmm. We'll just concentrate on the rest. And so right. we finished all the rest of it. And and the other thing is that the the kind of one rule that we had was that it was it was genuinely unreleased. The, the, none of this stuff has been heard before. We've never played it live. Right. Or anything. So it's... It's, they've never been road tested or anything, any of these songs. So, you know, in those days we were releasing singles off records and singles had B-sides. So we'd have, yeah. especially on as CDs, you would have three or four bonus tracks. So we would end up with the 12 songs on an album, but then probably with an additional 12 B-sides on yep. for each project. Mm-hmm. So, but these were just things that had never been quite finished or or were very late in the piece. Some of it was recorded I think after Golden Rule, which is our last record, yeah. you know, yeah, the yeah. Daybreak is the last song that we actually recorded, and that was written the day before, the night before, kind of the last day of recording. About right. it, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that might have heard whispers about some of the stuff on here, or you know, uh, there's going to be a, pe- a lot of people are excited about this release. Can you tell us? I mean, in, in this whole scheme, it kind of you, you had to woo up everyone who was thinking that you might be performing at the AFL Grand Final, you know, okay. with, with with all of this happening. Can, yeah. can you tell us how close you've been to doing how, how something cl- like that <laughs> over the years? Well, we we haven't really we haven't even come it? close. I mean, we we did the one night lonely thing, and yeah. that that came out of all of those meetings we were having. Yeah, yeah. Because right. we were saying, okay, we've got these songs. Should we put should we put something out and yeah. we'll get, we'll use the money, we'll donate it to support, to support Act or yeah. whatever. And then someone, I think it was Paul, our manager, said, oh, do you want to do a gig, you know, as a joke? Yeah. We were like, oh, yeah, fuck yeah. And then we just thought, sort of thought, you know what, it's so it, – because, you know, that lockdown time was – It was weird, every, yeah. Everyone was doing the weirdest <laughs> shit, yeah. weren't they? Not really. And yeah. Because any other year it would not have happened, I can yeah. guarantee you. Right. Um, so it was just it was just a symptom of that, you know. Um, 
Sorry, I'm crapping on. I can't remember what the question was. Well, I mean, in terms of like, you know, the glorious uh, reunion tour or reunion oh, yeah. show. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that makes sense. It was a it was a weird time and it was a everyone was tuned yeah. in at home, locked in. It was yeah. fucking, we don't even yeah. want to go back there. We don't ever want to think about yeah. that time. Um, mm. Great show though. Has there ever been talk, you know, like for example, I'd say like 2015, Cowboys, Broncos, grand final. Did someone knock on the door? Was that like, was there ever a... Was there ever no. a moment, or, or was I think it one no. Of you know what? You know when the the most likely time it would have ever happened was about three months after we stopped because the floods happened in Brisbane. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, and yeah. there was some sort of show or something. And um, but I I'd already gone. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I'd already gone to Spain by then. Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, it wasn't going to happen. But you know, even that AFL thing, it was just so ludicrous. Yeah, because. We're not a fucking band yeah. like playing, you know, we're not a band that plays live. Yeah. And there was, you know, there was a conspiracy between a few journalists and probably some people that were involved in the AFL and and also the guy that was booking the AFL yeah. grand final that wanted to whip up a bit of controversy and, and, and put pressure on us. Yeah. And, and we just fucking held a firm line and just like yeah. why don't you get a band like Violent Soho who are actually together <laughs> and in you town know? Yeah. yeah and in town yeah well I don't yeah. think that would have moved too many newspapers yeah, yeah I think that's, uh, you're, you're right about that yeah. to exactly. go back to uh, where this conversation started, started about yeah. unscrupulous journalism Uns- yeah yes that's yeah. right <laughs> so I was actually then my next one was going to my next question was going to be entrapment to say something along the lines of uh, if a <laughs> Queensland team makes makes the grand final in the NRL. Will you guys get back together? Because um, that's the headline. That's well, the Fox you know Sports what? Headline. The, oh, the fucking Titans have got a show at the, at the eight yep. next year. Tino! But, uh, <laughs> oh yeah! Don't we love Tino? Yeah. Wasn't that just the sweetest Queensland victory the other night no, too? No. Oh my no, it god! It was just. Well, from a mate of mine was saying the other day. He said, "If there is a god, <laughs> Origin is his favourite." Game, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and he and he's a Queenslander, yeah, yeah, you know, because yeah. it's true. It's just it just keeps on giving, doesn't it? Yeah. It's to amazing. us particularly because uh, the New South yeah. Wales wins over the years have been so, like they carried on at the end of the eight in a row, like they carried yeah. on. The Jared Hayne was crying and all that kind of stuff, but still, that was the first match with no fights. So that was yeah. like it was a hollow win, and it, everything's <laughs> been a hollow win since then. <laughs> <laughs> one in a row, mate. We've got one, one in a row. row yeah, yeah the clo- <laughs> they got real close to getting um, a bit of a streak going, but they got shut down this year by a bunch of nineteen-year-olds. So, um, yeah. yeah, maybe, maybe Titans uh, Broncos Grand Final. Bernard Fanning has said today on the podcast, <laughs> they, might, they might come back for the halftime show. Yeah. They do them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe or, a couple. Maybe a couple of us. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe if the Bulls win the Shield. Oh maybe. yeah. Oh. <laughs> They're a show too. But they are a show. Mm. They are a show. For once. Do you reckon they've yeah. had live have they had live music at a shoot shield or some, not a shoot shield? Well they're Sheffield about to Sheffield Shield. Sheffield Shield. Sheffield. Well that they're about yeah. to if they were. They're they about to. Yeah. They should. Yeah. The aspiring cricket journal from Brisbane might give them a little little bump <laughs> over the line. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining us today, Bernard. Um, My pleasure, James. What a great yarn. Yeah. What a yeah. great yarn. Great to hear about the life and times and of course. It's all paid off, you know. Big Sound in Brisbane is um, the new South by Southwest. Yeah, uh, so it is. And, yeah. Um, yeah, and Brisbane's entire kind of music and art scenes is much richer for you guys. So uh, thank you for joining us on the Batuta Advocate Radio Show. My pleasure. Thank you, fellas. Thank it's you. a great honour. And uh, tell Cogsy that the uh, checks in the mail for the articles that he wrote for us a couple of years ago. It's, uh, it's still coming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's a secret pen name. Yeah. <laughs> Wendell. Yeah. Yep. Uh, <laughs> very highbrow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no worries, boys. Thanks. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thanks, Thanks, nice talking to you.